Astonishing Legends would like to thank Simply Safe, Squarespace, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Astonishing Legends is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Last week, we introduced you to the legend of the 1949 St. Louis exorcism, the story of a young man who, thanks to author Troy Taylor, we now know was Ronnie Hunkler. Ronnie did not have the ideal childhood, and perhaps he suffered a bit from being different, as many of us do. But did that lead him to perpetrate a great hoax in the form of what seemed like a possession? Or did it simply make him more vulnerable to what some would have us believe was an evil spiritual influence? There will be time to unlock the answers to some of those questions in part three of our series. But tonight, it's time for part two of this story. After everything that's already happened, how much more could there be? Well, it turns out, the exorcism part of this story hasn't even begun yet. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. I am the devil himself. One of several rambling messages written by Ronnie Hunkler on a piece of paper during a particularly tumultuous night of his exorcism. Join us tonight for part two of our three-part special Halloween series on the real-life story that inspired William Peter Blatty to write The Exorcist. And we're back. That we are, folks. It's the spooky season, and while there is so much going on, uh, firstly, our other show, The Midnight Library, hosted by Ms. Miranda Merrick, is exploding in popularity, as one might imagine, and there are some really great episodes out with season five, including tomorrow's A Vision of Vampires and Blood-Drinking Cults. Yeah, that seems like a fun one for Halloween night. Also, Forrest and I have been appearing on quite a few other shows, uh, so look for Mark Watson's Peer Beyond the Veil Halloween Roundtable, as well as Bradley Netherton's show, Shack's Loop, wherever you get your podcast. Podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, to name a few. Or just ask your smart speaker to play them. Yeah, I had a real blast on Pure Beyond the Veil, and we had a lot of fun on Cole Shack's Loop, too, mostly because I got to meet some new people in the paranormal realm. Folks I've heard of, but never got to meet. So we got to meet virtually and hang out and, and make some new acquaintances, and everybody from TV writers to authors, to researchers, to other podcasters. And it was a lot of fun. And I always like increasing my Rolodex here, the paranormal Rolodex. So another person that we got to meet virtually anyway is James Rice, who we just sat down with a few days ago on the Fireside app. So James's dad, Jeff Rice, created the vampire slaying news hound and cult hero, and one of my personal heroes, Carl Kolshak. And he often got a view into the mind and creative process of the author. Yeah, he's a fascinating guy, and he's also had some pretty crazy mystical and spiritual experiences of his own. So if you want to hear our conversation with him, head over to firesidechat.com slash Scott Philbrook, and you'll see the replay there. So quickly, personally, two things I want to mention here. One, I'm really enjoying the series from CBS Productions called Evil. For those of you who have watched it, it deals a lot with this kind of subject matter, but in a modern way and trying to use science to figure out what's really just mental illness, and what is something that is more supernatural that the church then has to look into. And then secondly, I want to apologize for any past mistakes I have made, any future mistakes I'm about to make in tonight's part, and in part three, to our good friend of the show, Matthew G. Alderman, like my mispronunciation of the word diocesan. I don't even know that word. Uh, one last thank you again to Troy Taylor, too, for allowing us to use his book, The Devil Came to St. Louis, as a narrative guide for this astonishing story. If you want your own copy, we've got a link to where you can buy it in the show notes on the webpage for this episode. All right. Well, it's time for part two of the real life case that inspired William Peter Blatty to write The Exorcist. But first, a word of warning. Tonight's episode contains some censored but explicit language, in addition to descriptions and discussion of adult themes expressed by the extreme behavior 
and statements of individuals undergoing an exorcism. These passages may be unsuitable for a younger or more sensitive audience. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not playing around here, folks. This story takes a turn. But the details are important, so we're leaving in as many as we can. Yeah, this episode is not for the young ones. So looking back at part one, you'll remember that this story all started in Cottage City, Maryland, with a series of events that were witnessed by not only family, but a local Lutheran minister as well. That situation was considered an infestation. It had events that included furniture and other objects seemingly moving on their own. Now, in time, Ronnie Hunkler's family took him to St. Louis to be near other extended family members and try to explore what was going on further. It's at this point that the Catholic Church became involved, and the decision to seek permission to perform an exorcism became somewhat of an imperative. After those events and others we shared last week, it became obvious to Father Bishop that he needed to consult with someone else about what was happening to Ronnie, so he went to a close friend for advice, Father William S. Bodern. Troy Taylor explains in his book, The Devil Came to St. Louis, that Father Bodern was not a teacher, so he had more freedom. He was 52 years old at the time and a war veteran. Taylor posits on page 118 of the Kindle edition of his book that Bishop may have seen Bodern as a holy man, and as there's a difference between being pious and being holy. And Taylor states, quote, Piety can be seen and acted out, while holiness is internal and soulful. To Bishop, Father Bowden embodied this quality, end quote. Now, I just want to jump in here real quickly because as I'd read in the book here that that's an important quality for an exorcist because they don't want a demon or the devil to have an in with anybody that has any vices or or sins that can be exploited. So the the more a person appears to be, quote unquote, holy, the more strength and invincible they are. That's correct, right? Yep, that's absolutely correct. And and Taylor says that even other Jesuits referred to Bodern as a holy man. So it's interesting, and it says a lot for his character. Now, after some of the strange happenings with the Class II relic they had brought before, Father Bodern brought two of his parish's most valuable relics, the first-class relics of St. Francis Xavier. Taylor states that the saint was a former missionary in India and Japan, and he had died in 1552 on an island off the coast of China where he was buried. Sixty days later, his grave was opened, and accounts stated his body had not decayed. Now, at that point, he was taken to India and enshrined, but not before the Jesuit superior general ordered the saint's right arm severed below the elbow and taken to Rome to be placed in the altar of a church. So this is the impetus of relics. That's how this goes. Father Bodern brought a piece of bone from that arm to the Roanoke Drive house where Ronnie was staying. It was in a special glass container inside a gold reliquary. Bodern brought two more first-class relics in a hollowed-out crucifix as well. Well, that first night, scratches appeared on Ronnie's arm. Father Bodern pinned the crucifix with the two relics in it to Ronnie's pillow right next to the one that Bishop had already brought of St. Margaret Mary. In preparation for studying Ronnie's case, Father Bishop wrote down some basic information that would later become the exorcist's diary. It was uh, the religious backgrounds of the family and other details about them. Father Bodern would sometimes ask a question while Father Bishop was writing this stuff down, but mostly Father Bishop did the work. Now, after getting this file started, they heard a crash upstairs in Ronnie's room. They ran upstairs, and Ronnie told them he had been falling asleep when a bottle of holy water that was sitting on a table up there flew across the room, hitting the wall, and, and then fell on the floor, without breaking, at least this time. Well, at this point, according to Taylor, Father Bodern took out a rosary, placed it around Ronnie's neck, and then he and Father Bishop began to recite the rosary. Then Father Bodern shared the story of the 1917 miracle at Fatima. Now, this is the story many have heard of three young shepherd girls who, it is believed, encountered the Virgin Mary in Fatima, Portugal, and received three prophecies about the future two of which were revealed immediately, and one was kept a secret for decades before being revealed in May of 2000. So it makes reference to the death of the Pope, but some feel it's either been misrepresented or is inaccurate. But tonight's show is only about the fact that Ronnie took comfort in the story of the original encounter at Fatima. Now, after the relaying of the story of the miracle at Fatima, which Father Bodern would fall back on frequently, Ronnie calmed down, and Father Bishop and Father Bodern then left. 
And that's when things began to wrap up. So listen to this excerpt from page 113 of the fourth print edition of Tory Taylor's book, The Devil Came to St. Louis. A few minutes after Leonard left to drive the priests back to St. Louis University, the remaining adults heard something heavy scraping across the floor of Ronnie's bedroom. They hurriedly climbed the staircase once more and turned the knob to open the bedroom door. The knob twisted, but the door immediately banged into something directly on the other side. Edwin put his shoulder to the door and heaved against the wooden panel. It slowly edged open, and he was startled to find that the door had been blocked by a heavy bookcase. It had been slammed up against the door, having somehow dragged itself from the far side of the room. Edwin was barely able to move it out of the way to gain access to the room. So things are starting to ramp up here now, and the Catholic priests involved are about to be inducted into the world the Lutherans already experienced back in Cottage City. It's interesting to note at this point that Ronnie's mother, Odell, is still trying to pin the blame for all of this on Ronnie's departed aunt, Matilda, or Tilly, even though according to her own details of the onset of activity, things started happening 11 days before Tilly even passed away. Yeah. But not too long after this, Odell stayed behind in Ronnie's room to comfort him as he went to sleep. But she was unsurprisingly unable to sleep herself. And Taylor says at the top of page 115 of the print edition of his book that Odell suddenly felt a presence in the room. Ronnie had fallen asleep, but a stool next to the bed fell over and made a loud crack on the floor. This woke Ronnie up and immediately he felt something moving under his pillow. He grabbed for the first relic that Father Bishop had brought over, the relic of St. Margaret Mary that was pinned to his pillow, but it was gone. The safety pin was there, but the relic was nowhere. What's even more frightening is that the slithering under his pillow turned out to be the crucifix that Father Bodern had brought that had two first-class relics encased in it. Odell and Ronnie fled the room that night, and no one slept in there. Now, Troy makes a valid point here in his book that up until now, all this stuff could be Ronnie. Maybe Ronnie is pulling a sophisticated hoax or is mentally ill. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're not so sure that's the case. Yeah. Well, early on in his book, Troy Taylor makes reference to Father Malachi Martin, a man we've mentioned on the show before. In 1976, he wrote a book called Hostage to the Devil. That's a well-known book. Yes. I think we have a copy. We both do. It's thick. And in this book, he describes five stages to an exorcism. Stage one, the presence. An entity within the victim pretends to be the victim, but it's obvious the victim's personality does not comport with the new behavior. An exorcist must identify the presence by name of the demon, or at least try to. Stage two, breakpoint. The demon no longer pretends to be the victim. This transition is marked by violence and confusion, and is marked by extreme contortions, blasphemies, vomiting, and noxious odors, and then begins to refer to the victim in the third person. Stage three, the voice. The demon's voice becomes what Taylor quotes Martin as saying, inordinately disturbing and humanly distressing babble. This is apparently designed to interfere with the process of the exorcism. Stage four, the clash. A direct battle between the exorcist and the possessed. The voice of the demon silenced. A struggle to get more information about the demon so it can be controlled. Stage five, expulsion. From page 20 of Taylor's book, The Devil Came to St. Louis, quote, As God's will triumphs over the situation, the demon leaves in the name of Jesus. Everyone who is present feels the presence dissipate, and it often goes with fading voices and noises. In most cases, the victim will remember little, or perhaps even nothing, of the ordeal. So this is the battle that must take place. That is, if you are to perform an exorcism as defined by the Catholic Church. There is so much more that goes into this, though. More detail and information, and again, we encourage you to get Troy Taylor's book if you want to get into the weeds on it. Trust us, it's a page turner. Yeah, I, I gotta say, as, as someone who's not Catholic and was not raised Catholic, this process is fascinating to me. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. about it that practicing Catholics, I'm sure, are already familiar with, but I was not 
what I knew about exorcisms I took from horror movies. So understandably, there's some holes in my knowledge. <laughs> uh, but I, I guess the most important thing to understand is that within the Catholic Church, an exorcism is considered an extremely daunting thing to engage in. And it would seem that most priests do not think they are holy enough to qualify. As part of the process, they're invited to make a confession and fast in an effort to purify themselves for the battle they're about to do. A spiritually weak individual runs a good chance of failure, and the priest that agrees to conduct an exorcism must have absolute faith, not only in their own faith, but faith in God. If they falter, the slightest weakness will be exploited to the maximum extent, and the exorcism could not only fail, serious physical harm could come to both the victim as well as the priest involved. In fact, on page 15 of Troy's book, he points out that, quote, several exorcists died prematurely and some went insane, end quote. He mentions that death is a possibility for the exorcists themselves. It is seven years ago today, October 30th of 2014, we ran our very first Halloween special. It was about Greyfriars Kirkyard. Long-term listeners will remember the story. It was the early days, as that was episode three of our show, and this is now episode 220. But there was a haunting detail about the Greyfriars Kirkyard episode that sprang back into my mind as we covered this topic tonight. Now, Greyfriars Kirkyard is a haunted cemetery in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the center of the trouble there seems to be a mausoleum built for Bloody George Mackenzie and the Covenanters prison. <laughs> That's right. Bloody George Mackenzie. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Find the episode for more details. But the long and short of it is that uh, Father Colin Grant went to Greyfriars Kirkyard to perform an exorcism in November of 1999. Two months later, in January of 2000, he died of a heart attack. He was 67. Now, to be fair, he did have a heart condition, but you do have to wonder if there was a connection, especially when as he was leaving the Kirkyard on the day of the exorcism, he said to a reporter who was with him that day, quote, I wouldn't be surprised if this killed me, end quote. And I do believe he also reported seeing a shadowy gray figure kind of listing and misting about as he was walking to his back to his car. That's right. But regardless what you believe in, the process, even if you don't believe in uh, spooks and ghouls and demons and all that, it's very taxing emotionally and physically. Because we're talking long hours into the dark of the night. Also, a lot of these priests, like you said, they, they have to teach the next day or study. They've got other things to do, and they get up early, like 5, 6 a.m. So as you see, uh, as we'll be talking about Walter Halloran here, he had to go back to class. These other priests, they had to go teach and keep up with their chores. You're expected to, you can't lag. The other thing to keep in mind here, why this one was so exhausting with Ronnie, is that they were keeping it secret. So they can't be telling everybody like, well, I was really up all night doing an exorcism. So <laughs> sorry if I bow out of my chores today or I can't come to class. There's no excuse. They had to leave from that exorcism at two, three in the morning, get a few hours of sleep, get up at 5 a.m. and continue their day. It's very taxing. It's not for everybody. It does come with dangers that are physical and real to your health, to your emotional and mental state. So it's a serious thing. Hey, did I ever tell you about the time my dad worked for the FBI? What? No. What's the story with that? How have you not told me this? <laughs> no, well, don't get too excited. He wasn't kicking down doors or anything. A local bank got robbed and the FBI was working with the security camera footage, so they hired him to assemble it into a video. Whoa, that's cool. So how'd that go? I mean, what, what's the process like? So you might remember this, but a lot of younger listeners will just be shaking their heads. This was back in the late 80s and 90s, early 90s. And if I remember correctly, believe it or not, a lot of banks back then didn't have continuously running video being recorded. It's not like these days. So the bank's cameras would actually take shots of film in intervals every few seconds. But I, I think only once the alarm was triggered. Ooh, Patty Hearst style. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we had a film transfer side hustle going on then, and they looked us up and hired my dad to take the photographs and assemble them into an animated video to be used as evidence. <laughs> so he bought this really expensive specialized VHS deck that could assemble edit frame by frame, thinking, well, we could be doing this for the FBI all the time. 
And that was the one and only time we used it. Oh, typical man. Imagine all the crimes (laughs) that could have been more easily solved if we all had Simply Safe's new wireless outdoor security camera. Back then, we couldn't even conceive of the advanced high tech features Simply Safe's camera could offer, like 1080 progressive HD resolution. I mean, we'd be like, what are all those numbers and letters? And with an eight times <laughs> zoom yeah. so you can zero in to capture faces and license plate numbers, the FBI would be so jelly. Color night vision with a built in spotlight? Forget about it. With its ultra wide 140 degree field of view, that means you can keep watch over your entire yard. And with an easy to remove rechargeable battery, Simply Safe's camera can go anywhere on your property wirelessly. Nothing was wireless back then. Well, you don't have to work with the FBI to get what U.S. News and World Report named best home security system of 2021. And you also don't have to spend a ton of money to get the latest technology. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com/al. What's more, Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash AL. This is Kaylee Smith. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. So when Father Bodern came to the conclusion, and he did, that an exorcism needed to be performed on Ronnie, he did not think he was the right man for the job, which in and of itself is, it's humble, but Troy Taylor points out that none of the documentation makes it clear how the final decision was made, so we don't really know. But Bodern did request permission to arrange an exorcism from Archbishop Joseph Ritter. So this is from page 120 of the book. According to the Rituale Romanum, An exorcist, quote, must be properly distinguished for his piety, his prudence, and integrity of life. He should fulfill this devout undertaking in all constancy and humility, being utterly immune to any striving for human aggrandizement, and relying not on his own, but on divine power. Moreover, he ought to be of mature years, and revered not alone for his office, but for his moral qualities. Well, Archbishop Ritter was the spearhead of equality for black people within the Catholic Church in St. Louis at this time, and it was a politically delicate time for the church, but he stood his ground on the principle of opening the churches and schools to black people, even threatening to excommunicate anyone that went against his wishes. In the end, it worked, and ultimately he became a cardinal and part of the Vatican II Council as a leader of the progressives, which, according to Taylor, included several Jesuits. So. Archbishop Ritter approved an exorcism, but probably to Father Bodern's surprise, he also asked that Father Bodern conduct it himself. Now, his reasoning behind this is not known. He additionally told Father Bodern that it must all be kept secret. Again, Taylor speculates that might have to do more with not being a distraction or something that could be used against the church at this time in its fight for equality in the St. Louis area. And Father Bodern actually never did speak about this whole thing at any point during his life. But he did want to create what we now know as the Exorcist Diary because he was of the opinion that the case and how it was dealt with would be a good reference for future exorcists that might find themselves locked in a battle with evil. He couldn't find any modern references or guides on how to deal with that, so he thought this would be helpful to other people. Now, Taylor details on page 125 of his book that on March 16th of 1949, Father Bodern made a general confession prayed all day, and also began fasting, as that was instructed in the Rituale Romanum. By the time the exorcism was done, Father Bodern would lose almost 40 pounds. Wow. And did you explain to the listeners yet the difference between a general confession and a more personal confession for the priest? No, I actually, I didn't. If you'd like to, you certainly can. Yeah. It's important. Everybody knows, uh, or a lot of people do, when you go to make a personal confession, that's generally just what you did recently you're ashamed of, you get instructions on how to make penance for that, or I guess kind of write that. And it's an acknowledgement and a confession. It is literally confession because it's good to get it out there. You are acknowledging it yourself. You're being honest with yourself and a priest. And in this case, though, for a general confession, this is more like, as Troy describes, a knight putting on armor, girding yourself, protecting yourself for battle. Because a general confession is an overview of your whole life about what are your general faults? What are your weaknesses? What are the things that could be vulnerabilities? 
which a demon or the devil himself is going to attack to get at you, to unnerve you, to start chipping away at your emotional and spiritual armor, your belief, because they know that's what's going to happen because that's most effective. There's going to start to make you doubt yourself and make you lose your mind and, and wear you down. So what you do here is you, it's an introspection. It's being honest with yourself. You look over your whole life and you have to figure out what really makes you tick and what makes you fall apart. And you confess that. And it's also, it's getting it out there. So it's not a surprise if the voice of the demon comes out and accuses you of all of this stuff. And at that point, you got to deal with it. You're already dealing with it. You're, you're saying, yep, these are my faults. I'm working on them, but I, I have strength through my belief and I'm not afraid of you. So that's the point of that in a, in a general sense. Yeah, dude, that's very well put and well explained. You did oh, a better job. I'm glad I left it out, actually, because you explained it better than I could have. I saw the general, and like I said, I'm not Catholic either. I, yeah. That's why I found these rituals and concepts really interesting. Yeah, it is fascinating. Well, again, on that same day in the afternoon of March 16th, 1949, Bodern also reached out to a young former student named Walter Halloran. Walter was 26 and now a student at St. Louis University and a particularly fit athlete. Halloran looked up to Bodern, seeing him as a mentor, and they had become good friends. Bodern told Halloran that he needed his help with something, and he asked if Halloran could drive him to run an errand that night. In fact, he had Halloran drive him to Leonard and Doris Hunkler's house on Roanoke Drive, where Ronnie was staying with his parents. When the car arrived outside, Taylor writes on page 123 of The Devil Came to St. Louis that Father Bodern turned to Walter Halloran and said, quote, I'll be doing an exorcism. I want you to hold the boy down in case it's needed, end quote. All right, so this is a very special part of the show, and I, I want to set this up correctly. We mentioned this in part one a little bit, but a, a year or two ago, a talk show radio DJ with decades of airtime under his belt reached out to have us on one of his paranormal segments. His name is Dave Glover, and guess what city he's based out of? St. Louis. He's had us on his show several times. You can find Dave on KMOX 98.7 or odyssey.com slash KMOX. He's something of a kindred spirit. He actually even visited the Sally House after he heard about it on our show and had some very bizarre experiences there, which he came on and talked about back in February of 2020 on our show. But anyway, Dave has been pushing us to cover this story for a long time. And in fact, I think it's safe to say we're doing it this year because it was his idea. So Dave, thanks for that. I'm thoroughly enjoying this one, and I'm also pretty freaked out about it. But here's the other thing. 20 years ago, Dave personally interviewed Father Halloran shortly before his death. In fact, it was Dave's first on-air interview, apparently. And because he's awesome, he sent that interview to us in its entirety and told us we could use whatever we wanted from it. So right now, here tonight, we can actually play excerpts of Father Halloran. Take a listen to this little chunk. Today we have with us Father Walter Halloran, who is one of the gentlemen who actually participated in the exorcism in St. Louis. Father, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for being with us today, Father. I really appreciate you taking this time out. Now that must uh, 51 years ago. Correct. That, although I imagine that parts of that certainly uh, must seem like yesterday to you. Very often. Yes. Um, can you take us back 51 years? Now, were you a, a young priest at the time or actually a student, Father? I was a seminarian. Okay. And how did you come to be involved in this, in this incident? I, was, I became involved because of <clears throat> Father Bowdern, who was the uh, chief exorcist. He had been a friend of mine since way back in the middle 30s. Mm -hmm. He'd been, uh, he was president of the high school I went to. Okay. And how did you first become involved, Father? What was your first contact with this? Did Father Bowdern come to you and say, listen, here's what's going on, I'd like your help? No, it's that uh, Father Bowdern was having some eye problems, so he used to have to get someone to drive for him, and he picked me because he had you know, known me for a long time. Mm -hmm. so he just asked me if to uh, take him out on this particular evening and uh, gave me the address. We went to the address, and I asked him if he wanted me to come back at a certain time. He says, no, no. He says, you stay here with me. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we went into the house and met the family and met the little boy and began the uh, rite of exorcism. 
one thing to keep in mind about Walter Holleran is that, one, he's a big guy. <laughs> he's strong. And you need somebody big and strong. It's helpful because it's a very physical process. It's not just the sprinkling of holy water and reciting of prayers and rituals and this and that. People can exhibit some real superhuman strength. Yes. Whatever you want to call it, that huge adrenaline boost that people get in extreme circumstances like accidents and whatnot, where they lift over a car to to rescue a loved one, that can happen here, whatever the cause. And so you need somebody who's physically just imposing and big and can hold somebody down so they don't hurt themselves and others. And that's what you needed here. The other thing is to keep in mind is at this point in the story, Walter Halloran is a scholastic. He's not yet a priest. That's right. So he's studying. He's staying at the rectory. He is living on the first floor, I believe. So as far as the ranking goes, he he ranks below a priest. He has to look to them. He defers to them for guidance during the ritual. But he he is in the room there and witnessing everything and physically hands-on. Yeah, so keep that in mind. So as they entered the house, they prayed with Ronnie, and then they explained to him that they had to come to recite some special prayers and Ronnie understood. The two priests donned their stoles and went upstairs with two copies of the Rituale Romanum and a bottle of holy water, and thus the exorcism began. Now the following description occurs on page 125 of the book. Father Bodern crossed the room to the opposite side of the bed and made the sign of a cross as he sprinkled the bed and the boy with holy water. Then he knelt on the floor on one side of the bed and Father Bishop knelt on the other. The hunklers also knelt next to the bed, leaving Walter unsure of what to do. After a moment's hesitation, Father Bishop motioned for him to kneel as well. He lowered himself at the foot of the bed. Father Bodern led the group in a series of prayers of faith, hope, love, and contrition. Ronnie, who was lying in bed, joined in with them. The priest then began what was called the Litany of the Saints, asking the Lord to have mercy on them. The prayer asked for Holy Mary to pray for them, uttering in Latin what were familiar words to the Jesuits. As the words were recited, the mattress on the bed reportedly began to move. According to Walter Halloran, he saw it start to go up and down before his eyes. It levitated several inches, banged back down, lifted again, and then settled with a thud. Halloran looked over at Father Bishop, his eyes wide with surprise. It's no problem, Walt. Father Bishop whispered to the young man, just go ahead and pray. So here we are, out of the gates on this thing, and for my money, the real details of this story are even more frightening than the fictionalized account, because it's true. (laughs) I mean, I freely admit Mm. that my objectivity about things, specifically hauntings, has changed over the years since we started the show due to not only personal experiences, but research and interviews with witnesses. But at the same time, believe it or not, when I approach a story like this, I still try to figure out if it might be exaggerated or even a hoax. Right. So I still look for those details in the story that are hearsay and the details that might have maybe been shared by a witness who's guilty of their own confirmation bias. Now, I'm going to have a pretty deep analysis of all this in part three, but I wanted to say that much like the trace evidence in the previously covered Delphus ring UFO case of a strange substance left behind on the ground, I get excited when a relatively skeptical or even keeled man of the cloth who seems to take pleasure in shooting down the wilder details of this story, and I'm I'm talking about Father Walter Halloran, Mm -hmm. when he says that something unexplainable happened, well, that carries a lot of weight with me. Well, I have a quick thought about that because you and I have been discussing with some of the listeners as well about just bias, confirmation bias in general, our evolution, you could say, since the beginning of the show. What is the creed of this show supposed to be? Are we supposed to be totally objective down the middle of the road? Are we not supposed to do both sides-ism? Are we supposed to pick a side? How are we supposed to navigate this? Well, the style of this show is that you and I speak honestly we be ourselves, we talk truthfully, because I think that's that's how I want to be. That's yeah. how I want to present myself. We're not journalists who are supposed to be totally neutral and objective. We will present that view. But here's what I would say about personal bias or confirmation bias for myself is that, yeah, I might be painted as a, a believer in everything of the woo-woo or whatnot, but 
I would say that I just consider more probably than the person who is totally skeptical. Again, that's fine. I don't have a problem with debunkers. I would just say that they're limited. It's narrow. And it's not as much fun to me. It's not how I look at things in life. And to be honest with myself and the listener, I'm going to tell you all of my considerations. And certainly we all have personal biases. I think the only thing that would be negative here is if we lied by omission, if we didn't consider some things because we didn't believe in them. And that's not what we do here. We try and look at everything. And if people say like, well, you didn't really get into the skeptical angle on that. You could have done a deeper dive, not so much in the belief part, but in the skeptical, rational explanations of stuff. And we said this early on with some other stories and cases that often when we do that and it seems thin, that's because that's it. The skeptical angle doesn't go into how things were taken apart and how they really happened because it doesn't have to. So what I would say, when we do try to present the rational angle, the skeptical angle, in something that's as crazy as this or any other thing we do that seems outrageous, and we present the skeptical angle and people say, well, you didn't get very far with that. You didn't go down the real rational skeptical angle. And it's like, well, we did as much as was pertinent because it doesn't go very far. Because how do you explain what we're about to tell you now? What is rational other than there's wires and springs that you didn't see and it's Madame Minerva. It is the spiritualists and the physical mediums of yesterday doing these pranks to get customers in or for some other reason just to make you believe in it. That's more the rational angle. So when we do present something, it's like, well, you, we didn't really see a skeptical angle. It usually stops a lot further back because you can't go into a really in-depth analysis because to the rational angle, it has to be a hoax. Yeah, maybe there's springs and levers and this and that, and it was all faked, or they had some other ulterior motive to lie about this. And if you take the actions, like what we're about to tell you, as really happening, well, there aren't a lot of other unnatural explanations. When you look at it, like Walter Halloran, he knows what he saw. He was there. He can tell you what happened. How it was accomplished, he has no idea. But whether you believe in it or not, I would postulate that if you were there in that room, whether you're a believer, a skeptic, or a debunker, atheist, agnostic, true believer, it's going to scare the crap out of you. So here is what Walter Halloran described happening in the room when being interviewed by Dave Glover. All right, Brandon, if you would, roll that clip. How about the shaking of the bed? Well, the bed did uh, levitate. Uh, It wasn't the case. Someone, I don't know, I read an article or something that had moved because the bed had wheels on it. Uh, But I was leaning on the bed myself, uh, Mm -hmm. praying, and uh, the bed came up off the floor and then went down, you know, Mm -hmm. came up about. 10 inches, and then went back down. Now, was this something that happened over and over, or just one instance? The only the only time that I know was when the time it occurred when I was there, and I don't think it I don't think that it happened again. Mm-hmm. Right. So to echo what Forrest was talking about, here's what's crazy about that. What Father Halloran is saying here is that he personally witnessed the bed coming up off the floor, possibly up to a foot off the floor, and going back down while he was leaning on it, praying. Now, Troy Taylor interviewed Father Halloran around this same time, and in Troy's interview with him, it's evident that Halloran likely was not the only person kneeling and possibly pressing down on the bed when this happened. And this is me speculating here, but Troy's book Mm -hmm. describes five adults kneeling in the room. It's not made clear who might or might not be kneeling on the bed. Troy says the hunklers were next to the bed. It sounds like both Father Bodern and Father Bishop may have actually been leaning on it, but we know that Father Halloran, who was still a Jesuit student back at this point, and a very Mm -hmm. large and strong man, was leaning on the bed because he told Dave Glover he was in Dave's interview 20 years ago. And during that time, the bed levitated. This, for me, is hard evidence of something supernatural happening. Now, I know it's still hearsay, but I do not believe Father Halloran is lying here. And while I do believe all these years later, he may have some details mixed up, he may have said different things at different times, Mm -hmm. as many witnesses do when they are relentlessly asked about a single event in their lifetimes for decades. But I think he's crystal clear on this. This was the very first Mm -hmm. thing that he witnessed personally in this case. 
it would have been a life-changing moment for him, and I believe he's not prone to exaggeration. And in fact, that's evidenced by ongoing excerpts from his interview with Dave Glover. Uh, he's unlikely to reinforce anything that he didn't personally see, even going so far as to say things he didn't see probably didn't happen. Right. I look at it this way. Either it happened or it didn't happen, or it sort of happened in a way. It's like, look, other descriptions of the bed vibrating, dishes rattling. You could say, well, there was no truck going down the street. Maybe there was. Maybe that's what they saw. And that's a little bit of phenomena. And you could logically say, well, they, they weren't trying to lie. That's just what they saw. But what they saw was mundane. In this case, what's described is beyond that, in that if the bed goes up six to eight to 10 inches, it's noticeable. There's usually not a reason for that. If you look under the bed, there's got to be a lever. So either it happened or it didn't happen. And then if it didn't happen, several people are lying about it. Ronnie is, what's interesting is that he was totally unaware, I think for the most part of every session that went on, had no idea, or at least acted like he didn't the next day, like nothing happened at all. He would pass out, kind of go to sleep. He'd wake up. He'd be okay during the day. This happened at night during these ceremonies and rituals, and he was a different person. So a lot of people have to be in on it. Now, is that impossible? No, it's not. For whatever, whatever crazy reason you could cook up, and people do weird, strange things in groups, small groups, in large groups, individually, that's not impossible. That's not what we're saying here. So they could all be faking this. It's a little bit like the vertical plane. A small group of people would all have to be in cahoots, lying about a certain thing because they all witnessed it, or one person, Ken Webster, pulled off an amazing ruse and hoax and fooled eight of his closest friends and associates. That's not impossible. But again, you start to look at this stuff and how likely is it? Well, in this case, yeah, either the bed went up or it didn't. But wondering what the reasons are, it's like, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> and we don't know what it means yet. But this is one of the first instances where at least Halloran is saying, okay, something's going on here. And the other Jesuits that come to view later, and other priests, Father Van Roo sees that there's really something going on here. So these people who've seen this kind of stuff before, they become convinced. That's the point of this anecdote. Yeah, and I, I personally, I will just go on the record and say, I don't think Father Halloran's lying. Just based on his disposition and having heard the interview with him now and read everything I've read about him, I think for me, this particular instance proves that this case, for me, was more than just a misdiagnosed mental illness. This is right. something, something more is happening here. So as most of you know, for every episode we post, each one has its own Squarespace webpage where you can, of course, play the audio for the app, see links for the reference sources used in the books mentioned, a map where the story takes place, and a photo gallery if we use some pictures, and any other material that's associated with the topic. So it's not only just a place where we post the audio, it's really the most complete archive and repository for everything we've done. It's our hub, our library, our storefront. It's home to Tess's blog astonishing blog. It's our best face to the world. Yeah, it's all of that. And it's really the best tool we have for accurately tracking listener engagement because the big platforms won't tell you all you need to know. I mean, we get a couple of spam emails every week from some company offering to boost our SEO or search engine optimization. But frankly, we don't really need any of that because every Squarespace website and online store already comes with a suite of integrated features and useful guides that help maximize prominence among search results. The things like Google Search Console, SEO tools, and an SEO panel. And you really don't need to pay some company to analyze your metrics because Squarespace already has in-depth website analytics tools so you can really learn about your site visitors. Like how much time are they spending on your site? Where is your visitor traffic coming from? What devices? What countries? What pages are visited most? And what's your most read content? You also get sales and purchase funnel analytics so you can see how many visits convert into purchases, where your customers are dropping off, and how changes you make to your store affect conversion over time. And then abandon card analytics to see what isn't working. The bottom line is, with Squarespace, you're a more powerful online force than you realize, and you can have a website that becomes your everything. A statement to the world of who you are and what you do. A record of what you've done and a place where people can easily get what you create. 
And there's no better time than right now to start being that force of nature on the web. And there's no better way than going right now to squarespace.com slash legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. My lords and ladies, I am Lord Bloodraw, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Small thing before I forget, this is part three definitely, but keep this in mind as a little bitty seed that may germinate. What if extreme mental illness or some kind of condition can produce, let's say, telekinetic effects, psychokinetic effects? that are not so much spiritual, but it's like poltergeist activity in that maybe it's being generated out of this extreme electrochemical mental illness or condition, and that's what they're seeing. Yeah, but circling back on something that you yourself said, if it is mental illness, and let's say we accept the idea, if you believe any of this at all, that you can, there's a mental illness that allows you to have telekinetic powers, can <laughs> yeah. it also just go away and you're suddenly better after an exorcism? Well, that's a good question, and I totally agree. I'm on board with you here. These are the questions. I'm just trying to think of all the permutations of questions and, and ideas here because it's a little bit then the callback to Watsika in that was she really inhabited by the spirit of, of a deceased girl 10 years prior, or was it something extreme that was temporary, which enabled her to have amazing mental powers, let's say. So in this case, though, I think we're getting out of that territory because, as we'll see as we go on here and describe further what happens, it's so extreme that it's hard for me to imagine that this is just, yeah, somebody seeking attention. Well, this particular night, after the bed levitated, it, things got worse and worse. A series of horrific events unfolded, including red welts appearing on Ronnie's skin. Witnesses later described an image on his skin, like the devil appearing, something that looked like the devil with arms that seemed to be webbed, giving the hideous appearance of a bat, in quotes. Father Bodum continued from the Rituale Romanum, as he should, if focusing on the prayers for exorcism and asking for help from St. Michael the Archangel. As the prayers continued, Ronnie became more violent. Walter Halloran struggled to restrain him, but somehow the 95-pound, 14-year-old boy managed to break Father Halloran's nose. Listen to when Dave Glover asked him about this. And you actually, I think, came away with a broken nose, is that correct? Mm-hmm. And trying to hold him down at, at one point? It was just a mistake. His mm-hmm. arm was flailing around, and, and I just didn't duck at the right time. <laughs> So I have two observations about this. One, that again is confirmation that this actually happened for me. And two, I like how he's trying to downplay it. And I have a few thoughts about that. Firstly, I figured this is a big, strong dude. Broken nose mm -hmm. is not such a big deal to him. So it's a smaller story than it might be to other people who are like, oh my God, a broken nose. But secondly, mm -hmm. it's also a bit embarrassing to have your nose broken by a 14-year-old kid. Now, I'm not saying that Father <laughs> Halloran had some huge ego necessarily about this. I, I didn't know the man. But it reminds me of when I went to a special screening of one of my favorite movies, Three Days of the Condor. Oh, yeah. This was uh, at Beverly Hills at the Director's Guild, if I'm not mistaken. And there was a panel afterward. And even though Robert Redford was not there, a lot of other people were, including the director, Sidney Pollack. Oh, but yeah. it's not Sidney Pollack I'm reminded of about this. It was Hank Garrett. He played a mailman assassin in the movie. <laughs> I remember, yes. Yes, and, and no spoilers here. I, I mean, it came out two years after The Exorcist in 1975. It's an excellent film, but in the movie, he goes to kill Redford, and Redford winds up turning the tables and killing him after an impressive fight. Oh, you just spoiled it. Yeah, well, it's a very small piece of the film. But what I okay. remember about that panel is that to that day that I saw him at that panel, decades later, Garrett, I guess, was bothered by the fact that his friends, who I think may have been wrestlers and fighters, mocked him for letting that, quote, little redheaded boy beat him up. <laughs> Talking about Robert <laughs> Redford. <laughs> oh, dear. So this, this is my point. I can't imagine, regardless of the supernatural nature of it, that Father Halloran wouldn't downplay having his nose broken by Ronnie. Yeah. But needless to say, the exorcism continued after that. Listen to this excerpt from page 131 of Taylor's book. Finally, hours after the ritual had begun, came the last prayer of exorcism. Father Bodron began to read, making crosses in the air above Ronnie's flailing body. I cast thee out! 
every unclean spirit, every phantom, every encroachment of Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who, after John baptized him, was led into the desert and vanquished thee in thy citadel. Cease thy attack on man, whom he had made for his honor and glory out of the slime of the earth. Tremble before wretched man, not in the condition of human frailty, but in the likeness of the mighty God. Father Bodern continued the final prayer, his voice raised to the point that he was nearly shouting. Even with his louder cries, though, he could sometimes only barely be heard above the grunts, yells, and guttural barks that Ronnie was making as he rolled back and forth on the bed. Finally, the Jesuit called out the last words of the ritual, and after Father Bishop whispered Amen, silence fell on the room. The house was suddenly calm and Ronnie slipped down into what seemed to be a real sleep, free of the thrashing and of the nightmare that he claimed to have been experiencing. Father Bodern slipped to his knees and prayed silently for a moment. As he did, Father Bishop glanced at his watch. It was almost 5 a.m. Before we come back, one quick thing about that mailman fight scene. I thought what really made it accurate or had verisimilitude was uh, I think the mailman kicks the the mantle above the fireplace yeah. and it dislodges and comes up. It just didn't seem like it was orchestrated. It it really looked like a, a real fight. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It was a good sequence. Yeah, it was a good sequence. <laughs> Regarding this, though, I think you can take a clue as to the change in tone of the turn of events here by what happened to Father William A. Van Roo, who was a priest there, outranks Halloran, because again, he's a student, in that he thought that he was applying too much pressure to Ronnie's arms. And he said, well, look, you're just kind of making him uncomfortable, so you don't have to go that crazy on him. And against his better judgment, Walter Halloran let up his grip, and the first thing he does is fly into a rage, breaks Halloran's nose, backhands Father Van Roo in the nose, bloodies his nose, and then you understand that, okay, we're not goofing around here. There's a lot of strength being displayed here, and maybe it is that, you know, pumped up adrenaline, but you got to take this thing seriously, and maybe there is something unnatural, supernatural about this. So here we are again. Let's say you don't believe in religion. You don't believe in God. You're Lutheran, and you can't stand Catholicism. Maybe all those labels are wrong for this situation, but what is happening here? There's 48 people who all signed statements saying they thought this was the real deal. Even people like Father Halloran, who has zero interest in self-aggrandizement or exaggeration. Now, to be fair, that doesn't mean all these people can't be lying, but that's our point here with our statement earlier, or mine, my little ramble here, is that at some point, with that many people involved, the likelihood that it is some big prank or everyone's in on it becomes less, at least to, to my reasoning. So Yes, especially over time. The more people are involved, the harder it is for it to stay a secret. Right. Again, doesn't prove anything, but I think it's a consideration that maybe something unexplainable did happen here, and maybe you should look at it through a different lens. That's all I'm saying. So listen here again to another excerpt from Dave Glover's interview with Halloran. Now, Father, I saw you interviewed uh, incident to the movie Possessed, and you were talking about uh, one of the first things that happened was the bottle of holy water flying past your ear. Can you tell my listeners about that? Well, it, I was just kneeling there, uh, reciting the prayers of uh, using the rite of exorcism, and all of a sudden this bottle uh, flew past my head. It came from a dresser on the other side of the room, and mm -hmm. there was no one near it. And uh, you know, I was surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't guess. <laughs> and was that the first time you really thought, "No, wait a minute here"? <laughs> no, the, I I realized shortly after we began the uh, the rite of exorcism, uh, what it was mm -hmm. just from the wording of the prayer, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I just had the feeling, well, I'm here, so I guess this is it. Now, you had said on the interview I saw on television that you really weren't frightened. Well, I wasn't. I was mostly surprised. And uh, I looked to see whether there's anything else that go flying by my head, and there <laughs> wasn't. It was the uh -huh. only thing on the dresser was the bottle of holy water. 
Right. So this man saw a bottle of a holy water. I mean, forget what it is. Doesn't even matter. He clearly states that this small object was on a table, nowhere near anyone, and it flew across the room toward his head. Is he lying? If so, why? He did not at any point seek limelight from this case. Anyway, so round one seems like it's over. The question is, have they succeeded? And the answer is no. This cycle would be repeated. On the next day, they returned, and it was clear from events that day that there was still work to be done. They began again. This happened after they started. This is from page 124 of Troy Taylor's book, The Devil Came to St. Louis. A few moments later, Ronnie exploded into spasms with his arms and legs flailing. He tore at the blankets and sheets, his body whipping up and down, slamming back and forth on the bed. Edwin and Leonard rushed into the room and grabbed the boy's arms, just as Halloran took hold of both his ankles. But even with all three men holding him, Ronnie still managed to twist and whipsaw his body up and down until his back bowed into an arch. Father Bishop later wrote in the Exorcist's diary, the contortions revealed physical strength beyond the natural power of R. Ronnie twisted his head back and forth and began hacking up copious amounts of mucus mixed with blood. Although his eyes were tightly closed, he never missed his intended targets. Father Bishop tried to duck, but managed to be spattered anyway. He did manage to sprinkle the boy with holy water, though, and Ronnie screeched and cried when the water hit him as if in pain. Bodern wrote, he fought and screamed in a diabolical high-pitched voice. Father Bodern stopped reading and, as instructed in the Rituale Romanum, tried to touch Ronnie with a holy relic. Ronnie spat on it and then spun and managed to spit on Father Bishop's upraised hand. Father Bodern reached under his surplice and took a small gold box from a pocket inside his cassock. In the box was a round wafer the consecrated host that is revered as the Blessed Sacrament, the body of Christ, during Holy Communion. Ronnie's feet were moving on the mattress, pounding against the footboard of the bed as if stomping up a long flight of stairs. Father Bodern held the gold box near the sole of one of the spastic feet, and it suddenly stopped moving, even though the other leg continued to jerk in time with the march. So, things continued to escalate. Page 139 of Taylor's book describes how Ronnie's body contorted in the bed as his feet smashed the footboard in a stomping rhythm. At one point, his body was picked up and thrown back down on the mattress as if something was throwing him around like a doll. Then at midnight, he seemed to calm down for a moment, only to spring up onto his feet in the middle of the bed before dropping to his knees with his forehead touching the mattress. Father Bodern began the Hail Mary. His gyrations were in all directions. He pulled off the upper part of his underwear and held his arms high above himself in supplication. Then he made as though he was trying to vomit from his stomach. His gestures moved upwards, close to his body. He seemed to try and lift the devil from his stomach to his throat. Ronnie cried for someone to open the window and one of those gathered in the room threw up the sash. Cold winds whipped into the room, snapping the cloth of the curtains as Ronnie screamed again. He's going, he's going, the boy cried. There he goes. As these words echoed into the night, Ronnie collapsed onto the bed, his body limp and soaked with sweat. Father Bishop wrote, everything seemed to indicate it was over. In a moment, he seemed normal and seemed relieved. All of those gathered in the room knelt and Father Bodern led a prayer of thanks. Odell wept tears of joy. Ronnie told everyone what he had experienced. According to the boy, he had seen a huge black stain that had clouded his vision. Inside of the darkness, he had seen a terrible figure in a black cow who had turned and started to walk away from him. The figure grew smaller and smaller, and then suddenly it disappeared. The nightmare, it seemed, was over at last. For a moment, they thought things were handled. Maybe they had won the war. It seemed like something had changed. Ronnie seemed at peace in that story. Well, it seemed like the closing of a chapter. At 1.30 in the morning, Father Bodern and Bishop and Walter Halloran, not yet a father, they said goodnight. 
Father Bodern went to bed, exhausted and emotionally drained, when his phone rang at 3.15 a.m. His screams were horrifying as they came over the line. He's coming back, he's coming back, the boy cried. Father Bodern stumbled back to his room and hurriedly got dressed. Careful not to awaken anyone else in the residence hall, he quietly knocked on the door of Walter Halloran's room. The young man had just gotten into bed and he later recalled that Father Bodern said, quote, we're going to go again. He didn't have to say anything else. Halloran knew that they were going back to Roanoke Drive. That last bit was from page 140 of Taylor's book. Taylor says that many years after this, Father Halloran said it was the first time the Jesuits all fell into despair over the situation. They wondered if it would ever end, if, if they were making any kind of progress at all. So if you believe any of this at all, it's remarkable to me how the number one goal here appears to be to make the exorcist and pretty much everyone involved feel completely hopeless. Because <laughs> I feel like, as far as I'm personally concerned, that right there is the true essence of evil. Now, Troy's book goes into a lot more detail about the nuances of this journey, and one of the things that seems to happen from time to time is Ronnie's singing. Father Bodern talks about how beautiful Ronnie is able to sing, but during the course of this exorcism, he often breaks into song only to mock it. There's already been one incident, which we didn't share on the show, where Ronnie mockingly sang an old minstrel song in a pointedly racist way. This incident coming up is now the second incident, where he sings a hymn but again in a mocking tone, from page 142. Although his performance was excellent and a father bishop of professional quality, this time Ronnie's voice was mocking and almost cruel. <laughs> What's interesting to me about the minstrel song he shared earlier that only just occurred to me now as I'm trying to tie the narrative of this journey together with my own observations is I'm wondering if that was meant to be a dig at Archbishop Ritter, mm -hmm. the man who assigned Father Bodern to the exorcism and the man who was actively working at the time for equality for black people within the Catholic Church in St. Louis. Right. I think generally the purpose, if you if you take the setup to be accurate and true, the purpose of the infesting demon, the possessing demon, is to mock, ridicule, defile, blaspheme, yes, disrespect in every possible way, because it's also there, it is that bit of trickster thing where it's messing with you. It's trying to get under your skin. Yeah, it's undermining everything you think you know. Right. Or you could say that the case was, well, you know, Ronnie was just, he had some, he had some racist inclinations. Right. Because civil rights, right. there was a lot going on at this time, and it might have just been a front of mind sort of thing and not necessarily related. Right. Not related. But if it wasn't, if Ronnie didn't feel that way, how did he know then this Ritter connection? Because that would have, that would not have been clear to him. No, it wouldn't have been. And here's the other thing. As we continue, you're going to see that foul language and I mocking ideas that come forth from Ronnie during the course of the exorcism cross every line in the sand for everyone. And when it comes to verbal assault, everybody is assaulted in every way mm -hmm. possible because the demon, if you believe any of this at all, is looking mm -hmm. for points of weakness. So anyway, the battle went on with Ronnie becoming mm -hmm. particularly incisive. Listen to this from page 151 of Taylor's book. Again, this segment, listener discretion is strongly advised. For the first time in the exorcism, Father Bodern reacted to one of the things that Ronnie said. His prayer faltered and his face turned pale. He looked around for a moment, confused and upset, but then turned back to the prayer book and renewed speaking as before. Ronnie continued to scream and laugh describing his penis and the anatomy of the other men in the room. A towel had been draped across his body to soak up the urine, and he managed to slip his hands free, toss aside the towel, and pretend to masturbate. Father Van Roo and Halloran grabbed his hands and pinned them to the mattress again. He continued to shout, bawling out words that Father Bishop refused to record. He only noted that they were, quote, lowly and smacked of the abuse of sex, end quote. He also remarked that Ronnie, during his periods of daytime normalcy, never used obscene words. As the exorcism continued, Father Bodern had been working to get Ronnie into the Catholic Church to convert him from Lutheranism. Now, we recognize that for the atheists and agnostics out there, this can be a red flag when it comes to belief in this story. After all, no denomination is perfect, and for those of faith, the faith you choose to follow is a very personal decision, even if that's just straight up disbelief in religion at all. But for whatever reason, 
what was happening here did somehow seem bound to Catholicism in some way, and it seemed like its defeat would be bound to that too. Now, there's a hard battle taking place, and that was at the hands of the Catholic Church and their interpretation of the rite of exorcism. And Father Bodern clearly felt that Ronnie's conversion might help rid him of whatever was going on. History can reflect on that when this is all over, but for now, Father Bodern convinced Ronnie's parents that he should be baptized Catholic, even though it wasn't always seen as necessary by the Church if the person in question had already been baptized, which he had. That said, they arranged for Ronnie to be baptized Catholic on Friday, April 1st, at St. Francis Xavier Church, where the first-class relics had come from. The trip to the church for this baptism, however, led to one of the most extreme incidents in the course of the exorcism. From page 162 of The Devil Came to St. Louis. Leonard was driving and was rounding a corner a few blocks from the church when Ronnie suddenly sprang forward from the back seat, letting out an inhuman howl as he did so. Just moments before, Ronnie had complained to Odell that he was feeling sick. His parents assumed that it was nervousness about the baptism and spoke softly to try and calm the boy's fears. Just then, the car radio, which had been quietly playing music, began transmitting only static. A moment later, Ronnie exploded with rage. So, you're going to baptize me? He screamed in a horrible, guttural voice. Then, jangling, repetitive laughter filled the car. He howled at them. And you think you'll drive me out with Holy Communion? He screeched as he continued to laugh as he flew across the seat at his uncle. Ronnie grabbed the steering wheel and spun it so that the automobile headed directly for the curb. You son of a bitch! He yelled at his uncle when the man fought to pull Ronnie's hand off the wheel. Finally, Leonard reached out and pulled on the emergency brake. The car screeched to a stop, its front bumper resting against a light post. Ronnie let go of the wheel and then turned and grabbed Odell by the throat. Leonard turned the ignition of the car and shut it off, but the radio continued to blare static. It crackled loudly as Ronnie howled and beat his fist against his mother's face. Edwin grabbed his son by the shoulders and pulled him back. As he did so, Odell slumped out of the car and changed places with Leonard, who had also climbed out and now jumped into the back seat with Ronnie and Edwin. The two men forced the boy down on the seat, with Ronnie biting and barking at them, and Odell started the car again and continued to drive towards the church. Doris switched off the radio, but according to her later recollections, it continued to transmit loud bursts of static. After four hours of violent struggle, with Ronnie spitting blood and mucus on Father Bodern and others present, Father Bodern successfully baptized Ronnie. The most violent phase of the baptism was when Father Bodern asked Ronnie, Do you renounce Satan and all his works? Eventually, after so much struggling, he was weakened and he said the words in a whisper. Father Bodern returned to the prayers of exorcism as the relentless battle continued. They took Ronnie back home to Leonard and Doris's house on Roanoke Drive. As Father Bodron continued the exorcism, the following took place. He had barely started when Ronnie began to thrash about on the bed, and he ripped open his pajama shirt. On the skin of his chest was a large scratch that was tearing across his skin as the two priests watched. Suddenly, two more scratches opened and appeared on his chest, quote, as if a razor was moving inside of his skin. Ronnie screamed in pain, and the priests realized that the marks on his body had created a numeral four. This was one of many instances where writing appeared on Ronnie's skin, seemingly carved from within by an unseen force. Words such as hell would appear on his chest and thigh, as well as the word spite, which we'll find out in part three, is possibly the name of the demon in this story, differing from the movie. Eventually, they get a clue as to what might actually bring an end to this nightmare. As Ronnie continued to squirm on the bed, hissing with pain, a strange dark voice issued from his mouth. The priests had never heard it before during the exorcism, and Ronnie's parents and grandmother swore that Ronnie had never spoken in that way. The voice croaked out at them. 
I will not go until a certain word is pronounced, and this boy will never say it. This struggle continued for quite some time. The series of events, well documented. Ronnie's journey had taken him to several locations by this point. For those keeping track, Troy Taylor lays out a useful timeline of events across a couple of different pages in the book. He states it begins with an infestation in Maryland, and then he adds the infestation was followed by an exorcism on Roanoke Drive and Bell Noor in St. Louis. Eventually, it would end up at the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis, but along the way, Ronnie would also spend time in the old rectory of the St. Francis Xavier Church, or the University Church as it's often known. Each location has a long history to this day of lasting legends associated with the case, and we'll talk about that more in part three, but somewhere along the way, it was decided that Ronnie might need a break from all this, and he was checked out of the Alexian Brothers Hospital and taken on a bit of a field trip. That's a 75-acre Jesuit estate on bluffs overlooking the Mississippi River. Taylor talks about how there's stations of the cross on a path along the bluff up there. And he adds that these commemorate the last hours of Jesus as he carried the cross through Jerusalem to his place of execution. Ronnie took an interest in seeing the path. It has 14 stations. As they approached the 11th one, the one symbolizing that Jesus is nailed to the cross, Ronnie took off screaming and ran towards the edge of the bluff. Just as they reached the 11th station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Ronnie started to scream and run. He stumbled onto the lawn and launched himself toward the edge of the bluff that loomed over the river. Halloran sprinted toward him, tackled the boy, and tried to hold on to him. Ronnie fought him like a wild animal, and it was not until Hasbrook arrived that they were able to pin him to the ground. Halloran had never seen Ronnie behave this way during the daytime and wasn't sure what to do. So that excerpt continues. Walter Halloran and Barney half dragged and half carried the boy to the car, and they threw him into the back seat. Halloran held Ronnie down as Hasbrook started the car and pulled out onto the main road. He needed all his strength. Ronnie was fighting wildly. He battled the ferocious boy, but at one point, Ronnie broke free and lunged over the seat for the steering wheel. Hasbrook knocked his hands away and managed to keep the car on the road until they got back to the hospital. Dave Glover actually asked him about this whole thing that took place up on the bluff there. Listen to this. What came closest to scaring you? Uh, well, I, uh, one time when uh, we, were out, we went out in the country just to uh, get the, uh, the little guy away from the, uh, the hospital mm-hmm. so he could uh, get some fresh air. And, and we were walking along and talking. Uh, it was along the uh, bluff overlooking the Missouri. Mm-hmm. And uh, he suddenly took off and started running. And, uh, which surprised me and I called his name and nothing happened. So I ran after him and grabbed him and, uh, we were both looking over the edge of the bluff Mm. cliff when I got him and, you know, so that was scary. So many incidents that were so extreme for so long. It's crazy how intense this was. The movie is nothing on this in my opinion. Well, as they get closer and closer to edging whatever this thing is out of Ronnie's body, they start to get more and more specific information about the date and time of its possible departure, which is part of the Rituale Romanum. It's is to try and get this information out of the demon. But unfortunately, they were getting details that maybe they relied on a little too much because you got to remember what you're dealing with here. He finished the prayers and began to recite the rosary. All the men present joined in, and the comforting sounds of the prayers filled the room. At 15 minutes before the promised departure time of 11 p.m., a church bell tolled. Ronnie laughed and began to imitate the sound of the bell. When 11 p.m. came, the bell fell silent, and everyone waited for the end of the session to come. The group was filled with anticipation, waiting for the demon to leave in whatever manner such things occurred. They waited but the moment never came. Instead, they were assaulted by Ronnie's eerie laughter and another uncanny imitation of the church bell. The Rituale Romanum had warned them, never trust the word of a devil. But the end of this nightmare was in fact nigh, and soon the word that the demon said would never be uttered by Ronnie was uttered, but not exactly by Ronnie. 
Ronnie sucked in a long breath, and then a new voice came from his lips. It was a loud, clear, masculine voice, and one that was much different from the chilling voice the Jesuits had gotten so used to hearing. The voice claimed to be that of St. Michael the Archangel, and it ordered the demon to depart. The voice shouted, I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus, immediately, now, now, now. Father Bodern suddenly realized what the word was that Ronnie would never say. It was Dominus. That was the word. Father Bishop's diary then went on to record the most violent contortions of the entire period of exorcism. He called it a fight to the finish as Ronnie's body went into a torrent of painful twists and spasms. Then he fell quiet. A moment later, he sat up, smiled, and then spoke in a normal voice. He's gone, Ronnie said, looking around at the priests and the monks with the first real smile that any of them had seen from the boy in a long time. The exorcism was finally over. That's going to wrap up part two of our three-part series on the true story that inspired The Exorcist. A very special thanks to Dave Glover. The Dave Glover Show has been driving St. Louis home for over 20 years. Unafraid to discuss virtually any topic, you'll hear Dave and his crew's unique perspectives on current events, news and politics, and anything and everything in between. Listen from 2 to 6 p.m. Central Time on 1120 a.m. or 98.7 FM in St. Louis online at odyssey.com slash KMOX or find the show wherever you get your podcasts. Check it out, folks. You won't be disappointed. We'll be back in two weeks with part three of this series on November 13th. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and Brandon Schexnader. The show is co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night.